The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome to our webinar, How to Offset Rising Energy Costs and Increase Profitability, by Brian Schwaller of Ecomanity. My name is Ryan Kauf, and I will be your host today. I direct the Wisconsin Small Business Development Center, or SBDC, at UW-Green Bay, which is also known as ECOU. The Wisconsin Small Business Development Center at UW-Green Bay is part of a statewide network supporting entrepreneurs and business owners through no-cost, confidential business advising, and targeted education programs. Regional SBDC experts facilitate improvement and growth for small and emerging mid-sized companies and help launch successful new enterprises. The no-cost business counseling and low-cost leadership development training at the Wisconsin SBDC at UW-Green Bay is funded in part through a cooperative agreement with the U.S. Small Business Administration. Our website is uwgb.edu slash sbdc. We call these monthly no-cost 30-minute webinars our Secrets to Success series, designed to help small business owners and their executive team members increase their financial success. At the conclusion of this webinar, we will share the upcoming webinar topics, and we encourage you to consider registering. We thank Mickey and Tim from First Business Bank and Michael Wentworth of TMR Associates for their partnership in developing and promoting these monthly webinars and for their dedication to small business success. There's Michael Wentworth there. After the webinar, you will be emailed a link to a recording of this webinar. And during the webinar, you are invited to ask questions at any time. Please use the menu along the right side of your screen indicated here in the red circle. Type your question and hit enter. As soon as I see it, I will make note of it for the presenter to address toward the end of our webinar. And now I'd like to turn it over to our expert presenter this month, Brian Schwaller of Ecomanity. Brian? Thank you, Ryan. Um, yeah, hopefully you guys will find this interesting and uh, find a few ways that you haven't uh, looked at already as far as uh, reducing your energy needs at your facilities. So uh, with that, we'll get started. Um, a little bit about our companies, you know, where we're coming from here. Um, people always ask, how do you get the name Ecomanity? Ecomanity was found uh, with the idea of ecology and humanity working together. Obviously, Ecomanity um, comes out of those two words. Uh, in 2008, we were a renewable energy company, but we soon realized that most of our customers needed energy efficient upgrades. Um, so in that case, we became, in 2009, an energy efficiency company. And the real reason for that is that every dollar spent on energy efficiency saves three to five dollars on your renewable energy system. And so the goal at Ecomania is to help our clients reduce their energy costs through energy efficiency and renewable energy solutions. And by doing that, we help improve our customers' financial and environmental sustainability by reducing their need for energy. Um, a, a few more things about the company. Uh, we call it the Ecomania Advantage. And we are an independent energy consulting company with solutions that fit our client-specific needs. Um, what that means is we're not just uh, sales reps trying to sell you know, a specific product. We come into a facility, determine what's going on, and then develop solutions that would uh, help reduce energy. Um, everything we do is full turnkey, meaning uh, save time, money, and resources. Um, a lot of the projects we do um, save energy and reduce maintenance. So uh, that, that directly leads to more company profits, and I'll talk about that uh, a little more later. Um, we are able to track and chart energy usage to guarantee results, and we are a proud partner of Wisconsin Focus on Energy, um, and we do track the local, state, and federal incentive programs to make sure that our customers are getting the most amount of money back um, for their energy projects as possible. A uh, little bit about me, uh, real quick, just so you understand how I got to where I am. Uh, graduated Lakeland College here in Sheboygan uh, in 2001. Started to find a need for wind and, and uh, solar, um, my personal need uh, specifically. Wanted to learn more about it. Took the site assessor training in, in 06, uh, photovoltaic site assessor training in 06, wind turbine design considerations, non-residential TV, um, green workplace auditors, integrated design for energy efficiency. 
uh, retro building systems, retro commissioning, HVAC, rooftop optimizations. Those are specifically focused on uh, energy programs. I'm also a board member of Nourish Farms, president of the Sustainable Living Group, and a certified site assessor through the state of Wisconsin. I was nominated one of the top 10 young professionals in Sheboygan County, and I am appointed to the mayor city of Sheboygan Sustainable Task Force. Um, ener energy reduction, why is it important? The big thing is the global demand for energy resources is on the rise. More people equals more stuff. Um, we know India and China are very uh, emerging markets right now, so there are huge demands in those countries. Um, as costs go up, supply goes down. I mean, it's basic macroeconomics, obviously. Um, and there's been about 6% inflation on average. That's 20-year average for electricity. Um, a five-year average, depending on gas or electric or whatever, it could be much higher. So what does that mean? That means a kilowatt hour, what you're paying for per hour is a kilowatt hour, um, maybe is 11 cents a day, and in 20 years from now, it'll cost over 50 cents a kilowatt hour. Um, so you look at, you know, um, making energy improvements going forward, um, powering our economy now versus the future. The past 100 years, it was great, coal, oil, gas, it worked fine. Um, we still need it today. However, when you think about going forward in the next 100 years, I believe there's uh, clean energy technology and energy efficiency that's going to lead the way um, in our new economy. Um, this is a nice chart from the U.S. Energy Information Administration, but it kind of shows what I'm talking about, that uh, inflation with energy. And this, these various lines show industrial, commercial, and residential um, rates. But you can see they kind of peak out in summer, you know, when the air conditioning is being used the most. But um, you can, you know, basically see that from uh, 01 through 2013, there's over 40% increase across the board. Um, so that's a pretty significant increase that needs to be accounted for, you know, when we're planning budgets and things like that. <laughs> um, the report, uh, Power Forward 2.0, was put together. And uh, basically what they found was, according to that report, 43% of Fortune 500 companies, or about 215 of them, have set targets in one of three categories, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, improving energy efficiency, and re using renewable energy. So that what that means is that a significant portion of the companies out there are making an effort to reduce greenhouse gas, improve energy efficiency, and use renewable energy. And that's because they understand that they can't afford to pay 40% increase over 12 years. Um, energy reduction equals cost savings. The more you reduce, the more you save. And this chart is kind of nice because it shows your energy costs go down, but your utility savings goes up. So that means as uh, utility costs increase year after year after year, what you save this year, say you make you do a program and you save $1,000 this year. Well, next year you might save $1,200. Year after that you might save $1,500. So utility savings goes up as energy costs, as you reduce your energy costs over time. I really like this slide. It's just kind of funny to uh, throw it in there. Um, but it's, it's, you know, it just kind of shows that uh, you know Uncle Sam's waiting for cheap oil. And it's kind of funny because we kind of have cheap oil right now. I just got back from a trip and oil prices were quite low, gas prices were. But you know, basically, it's delusional. I mean, there's, it's not going to happen. Oil prices are going to continually go on the rise. Um, coal is going to rise. Nuclear is rising, and um, you know basically the cost of energy is rising. So, so the big thing is, you know, to make sure that we understand that, and that we have to take control of how are we going to, you know, stop the bleeding and control those energy costs. One of the easiest ways I call it the low hanging fruit to reduce. Uh, energy costs, and I'm sure a lot of you might have already done this, is lighting. Um, it's the low-hanging fruit. And uh, the thing to know about lighting is that a cheap light bulb, like an incandescent light bulb, a metal halide, mercury vapor, a cheap bulb usually costs a lot to operate. And um, so really you're looking at the cost of lighting as the installation costs plus the operational costs over the life of the bulb. Um, and you really need to take all of those things into, into consideration. And when we do cost analysis, we do show those uh, types of costs so that you can, you know, one a person is able to make an apple to apple comparison on which lighting system might be the best for them. Um, if you have HIDs, metal halide, mercury vapor, high pressure sodium, things like that, uh, incandescent lighting, T12s, um, it's, they gotta go. Time to replace them. 
uh, the cost can be a lot of money. Um, and the new technologies, that the LEDs, the compact fluorescent light bulbs, the linear fluorescence, the, T, the T5's induction lighting, they use 40 to 80 percent less energy than the bulbs they replace. So when you start to look at energy savings plus maintenance savings, a lot of these uh, are longer life bulbs than the ones that you might have in already. Um, it, adds, it ends up being quite a bit of savings. A case study that we have here is your pole lights. This is for a resort. Um, 46 pole lights, um, 250-watt metal halide, a 30-watt LED. <coughs> Actually, this was a safety issue for the resort because of those 46 pole lights, I believe 21 of them were not working at the time that we did the, we did the uh, retrofit. So not only is that a, a safety issue for the uh, customers, um, but and also a liability issue for the company. Um, but you know, if people don't feel safe walking around um, in the middle of winter, then they're not going to come back. Um, so what we did here, our goal, maintain or increase current light levels while decreasing energy and maintenance costs. Um, annual savings was $5,400. Um, basically what that was was 3000 in annual energy costs. Um, we were lucky enough that the resort actually tracked their maintenance costs on their full lights, and so that 2400 is an actual number. 2400 in savings annual maintenance was about a 1.9 year ROI after incentives, and the five year LED warranty equals peace of mind, and uh, the five year savings is projected over $27,000, and that does not include inflation. We got another case study here. This was a car dealer, auto body shop. Um, retrofitted old inefficient metal halides and T12 linear fluorescence with a new energy efficient T8 lighting. Um, for those of you that don't know, the T12 lights are an uh, inch and a half diameter and the new T8s are one inch diameter. And um, the difference also is that the T12 uses a magnetic ballast and the new T8s use an electronic ballast, which are more energy efficient. The goal there actually was to increase lumen output while lowering energy and maintenance costs. The reason for that is being an auto body shop, they're always working under the hood, they're working under the car. You know, light is usually above the car and it's hard to see. So we wanted to increase light output and that's exactly what we did. The result of that was very happy customers, which of course make our very happy employees, which makes the boss happy as well. Annual savings, 4785. Of course we verify all these numbers. Um, uh, Savings in energy was almost 4,000. Annual maintenance was about 800, um, 3,000 in incentives um, from Focus Energy and EPAC, which is a tax deduction for the federal government, no longer in place, and uh, about a 1.1 year ROI, five year energy savings in the right around the $24,000 mark. Uh, another another lighting case study. I do a lot of lighting stuff. Um, because it is a low-hanging fruit, there's a, a ton of uh, opportunity out there for businesses to save money, and it is the most. What we find is typically the most cost-effective, um, you know, energy efficiency upgrade. So that's why I focus a lot on lighting. This was a credit union. I made 44 office fixtures, T12 and T8 linear fluorescence troffers um, in the grid ceilings, and we replaced those. We retrofitted those with the LED troffer kit. On the goal there, they were happy with their light levels. Um, it was just turning into a maintenance issue, so we were uh, trying to maintain their current light levels and lower energy and maintenance costs. Um, annual savings, they're about $1,500. Um, they got about 900 back from Focus on Energy, five-year warranty on the LED fixtures, equals low maintenance costs, and a 70,000-hour life expectancy for about 15 years. And the key there really was this was a branch a little further away from the rest of the branches. And so for the facility guy, it was becoming a maintenance kind of a kind of a nightmare. If you had to drive over to that branch, it was it was uh, you know taking a lot of time out of the day, and, and uh, you know it's a long way to go to replace a light bulb or two. So um, here's some other lighting opportunities to look for um, this year and in 2015. Exterior HID pole lights, the LED, um, very common right now. A lot of people there's car dealerships. Um, gas stations, you know, security wall pack lighting, parking lot lighting, all that kind of stuff. Um, same thing with the wall packs I just mentioned. Focus on Energy has the ELO program. That's the Exterior Lighting Optimization Program. We are trained in, and uh, certified in that program with Focus on Energy. And what that means is there's extra incentive money for exterior lights that are on stuff to dawn. And, and uh, 
uh, basically focused on energy is giving $140 per fixture to retrofit a 400 watt HID. I think it's 115 per fixture for a 250 watt HID. Um, and those are specifically dusted on. I mean, there are some uh, conditions that apply to that program. Um, but uh, regular incentives do apply as well, so you can get 50, you know, 40, 50, 60 dollars per fixture for non-dust to dawn fixtures as well. But specifically with that ELO um, exterior lighting optimization program, pre-approval is required. So it's something where we got to pre-qualify the customer, fill out a couple forms. Um, it's, it's it's not it's not a hassle or anything, but it's just something that we have to do to get them the extra money. Other opportunities here: um, high bay HID interior lights. Um, that's uh, still fairly common. We still find a number of those. Um, we're seeing more and more go to LED, or still cost-effective option is the T8 or T5 option. Um, incandescence to LEDs, we've been doing just a ton of these this year. Hotels, restaurants, stores with track lighting, um, you know, mom and pop stores, things like that, where they sell a lot of incandescence. And uh, the T12 linear fluorescence, those have been phased out now for almost two years. I would say upgrade immediately. And uh, you know T8 or T5 or LED because those are um, those are completely phased out by the government right now. Hey Brian, uh, one question came in specifically about that auto body shop. Do you remember how about how many lights you replaced in that? Mm, I'd have to double check that. Okay. I do not recall. It was a smaller auto body shop. It wasn't like a big dealership. It was kind of a salvage yard, they do a lot of like repairs, maintenance kind of stuff, so it was, I don't want to say, it was, you know, it was a small, it was probably like a mid-sized, mid-sized type auto body shop. Okay, thank you. Yep. So we can go to the next slide, Ryan. Okay. Another thing, uh, this is something that's not as common as lighting, but it's something we've been doing a lot of, and that's um, power conditioning or power factor correction. And uh, a couple of things here. According to Alliant Energy, some of you might or might, may not use Alliant. They're a large utility in our area. A result of low power factor in, um, includes decreased system capacity and increased system losses. And according to the U.S. Department of Energy, low power factor can cause power losses in your distribution system, including voltage drops. Um, obviously, voltage drops are not good for motors. You know, <laughs> really not good for anything. Um, inductive loads are the primary cause of low power factor. So um, things that can cause or that have inductive loads are motors, compressors, pumps, fans, the HID lighting, and um, among other things. Uh, low power factor can cause overheating and premature failure of motors and other inductive equipment. And the easiest way, I mean, we've been able to verify this with the non-demand charges on bills, a reduction in improving power factor. However, if you pay a demand charge on your electric bill, and you'll see You'll have your uh, kilowatt hours that you're paying for, and then your demand. If you're paying a demand charge, you will benefit for sure from improving power factor. Um, case study: uh, This was a smaller, mid-sized manufacturing facility, and we do we do our tests within the same billing cycle. Um, so yeah, 45,000 square foot manufacturing facility before install. They were at, at about 1,000 kilowatt hours a day and a power factor of 80. We were able to test that after install. They were at 859 kilowatt hours per day, and a power factor of um, 97.8. And uh, it shows 16.7% verified. Of course, the numbers would, be, you know, if we go from uh, 80 to 97.8, I would say we did get um, almost 18%. We did actually verify the 16.7%. That equated to about $450 a month for them and a return on investment of under one year. And the nice thing about the um, most of the uh, power conditioning units is they do come with surge protection. So there's not surge protection on your system already, and you are protecting it from, from those uh, surge pr surges in the future. Um, another way to reduce energy costs is heat recovery. Um, heat recovery is where you take treated air from one area where you don't need it and move it to another area. Typically, it's just being blown out of the facility somewhere. Um, heating and cooling, as you know, this is Wisconsin. It gets uh, hot in the summer, really cold in the winter. So it's a big cost. It's a big cost for businesses. And if you have a process that creates heat in your facility, then I say don't waste it. We 
can uh, reclaim and filter that uh, previously treated air, right, because you already paid to heat it up. And if your process is using that air and then spitting it out of the building somehow, and um, so reclaiming and filtering that air is able to um, lower heating and cooling costs. We've also found that it helps maintain building temperatures, the hot and cold spots. We all know the uh, office uh, office people that have the heaters underneath their desk. Um, that's obviously an issue. Uh, improve employee comfort. Again, that's a hot and cold thing. And significantly lower energy usage. And um, we've done a number of these projects. This was. Uh, one of the first ones that we've done. This is a printing company. We actually went in there, did a did an energy audit on their facility, and the interesting thing was they had really taken extensive measures to be as efficient as possible. But we did find that through their printing process, they had a, a significant amount of waste heat leaving the building. The reason it was just being dumped out of the building is because it said it had ozone. In the, in the waste heat. And so we said, well, how much ozone is in the heat? And they said, well, I don't know. And I said, well, let's look into testing it. <laughs> and it turns out for 800 bucks, you can do an ozone test to have some come up and document all that stuff. And there really wasn't that much in it. But just to be safe, we put in carbon filtration systems. So the point of this is that, you know, just because, you know, the manufacturer says something, you, it really pays to actually figure out what does it cost to test it and let's and, and, and see if we can reuse this. And in this case, there was very little ozone. Actually, there was more ozone in, in outside on a sunny day than was actually coming out of these units. Um, but we did filter the air anyway. So in this case, we researched, designed, and installed a heat break system to recirculate 13,000 CFM of exhausted treated air back into the building. The estimated savings year one was about $16,000. They did get a focus on energy custom incentive. It was over $7,000, I believe. We did get the EPAC 2005 tax deduction. Again, that's no longer valid, but it, it did play into the uh, ROI on this unit on this project. And uh, the payback after incentives was about 1.75 years. Um, reducing the energy cost saves money, of course. I've been saying that the whole time. But energy cost reduction directly leads to more profits by cutting your utility expenses. Um, it's not like buying another piece of equipment or hiring more people. You hope that it'll make you more money. This does make you more money directly because you're cutting an expense. So it's directly to the bottom line. Um, energy costs continue to rise, so reducing your energy costs now saves you more money in the future. You, I told you earlier, you save 1000 this year. It might, it might be 1200 next year. It might be 1500 the year after that. Um, some tips that we found useful is uh, financing the project using the energy savings to make the payment. A lot of times the business will have cash allocated for a new piece of equipment or an addition or something else that they have to spend their money on. There's always things that a business has to spend money on. We can, if we are able to finance the project out of the savings, if you're able to save $200 a month, we can take, you know, 150, 180 of that, put it back into the payment of the, of the project and uh, it pays for the project. And then the next thing you can do is once the project's paid for is take those savings, um, the full 200 a month, and put it into the next project. Usually there's a, there's a phase one and a phase two and a phase three. There's always something more that we can do to, to cut energy. Um, what else can be done? Uh, renewable energy. Um, I'll just talk briefly about that. A list of companies that reported significant savings in 2012 from carbon reduction programs and renewable energy projects. These are the Fortune 500s I was talking about earlier. UPS saved 200 million, Cisco 151, PepsiCo 120, United Continental 104 million dollars, General Motors 73. You guys get the idea. But the point here is, is the real dollars. They know that the stuff is costing them money, and they're, they're specifically targeting ways to reduce their energy costs. Um, one of the ways to do that is with solar energy. There's a number when people talk about solar, there's a few different things. They can provide electricity, which we call photovoltaic or PV. They can provide heat, which we call solar thermal. Also, so, solar thermal could be hot water, also known as solar hot water. Um, so when people say solar, oh, did you do solar? It's like, well, yeah, but we, <laughs> what kind of solar are you talking about? Um, every dollar spent on energy efficiency will save you three to 
five dollars in your renewable energy system. This is because um, it's not a one-to-one -one ratio. If you cut your um, energy usage by ten percent, you might don't, you might need twenty percent less solar to, to to offset that system. So it's a significant savings on the renewable energy side uh, by targeting energy efficiency first. Um, next slide, please, Ryan. Uh, one of our case studies, we've done a number of solar projects as well. Um, this was a, one we were really happy with. Great customer. Um, found these quick mart up in Cleveland, Wisconsin. If you guys have ever been over to LTC, I-43 and Highway XX, uh, we did a site assessment first. And that's really the first step for a solar project. The reason is this. Is the site good for solar? If so, where should the solar go? What are the costs? What type of system is going to work best? The ground mount, a pole mount, a tractor? It's, it's like uh, you know, not having an art, you know, or having a contractor bid for a house, and you don't have plans. <laughs> it's really hard to do, right? And you're not going to get apples to apples bid. So the, the first thing we like to do is perform the site assessment, determine if there is a location, where it is, how is it going to get mounted, and then uh, then put it out to bid. In this case, we designed and installed a 19.92 kW solar electric system in We Energy's territory. The incentives included a 30% federal tax credit that is still applicable today and uh, will be next year as well. Uh, focus on energy incentives and uh, renewable energy is property tax exempt in Wisconsin. That means you make an improvement on your facility and it, and it, uh, it doesn't affect um, your taxes. Um, this is just kind of a picture of the project. If you come with me to the tractors, there's seven trackers on that property, a total of 19.92 9, kWs. And again, we could have put them on the roof, but the roof needed maintenance. Um, it's something she didn't need at the moment. Um, if you notice, there's a drive-through for semis that, that come through there. Um, so a lot of things go into consideration. There's um, um, the second tracker from the left. You'll notice the three red posts. Those are little bollard posts, concrete posts that we had to put in to make sure the semis don't hit the hit the uh, panels as they come in. So there's a lot of things that go into effect um, when designing a proper system for a facility. Um, what else can be done as far as reducing energy? Geothermal heating and cooling systems. Um, we did write grants last year for geothermal heating and cooling systems for the city of Kiel, uh, their municipal building, and their police station. Um, we talked about lighting again, motion controls, occupancy sensors, reduced wattage lamps, and daylight harvesting or light tubes in the ceiling. Those all offset lighting costs and can have pretty significant paybacks. And then also uh, getting ventilation and cooling upgrades, uh, replacing all the equipment. I mean, I go into facilities that probably have 50, 60 year old boilers. Um, you know, on brand new boiler, it's 96% uh, modulating. It's going to be about 40 to 50 more efficient than that old boiler. So upgrading new equipment, replacing old filters, and cleaning and servicing existing existing equipment is going to save um, energy costs. Uh, next up, I say don't wait for oil and electrical prices to drop, because they're not going to. <laughs> Be proactive in achieving your energy and maintenance savings. Schedule, uh, schedule an energy audit immediately if your company has concerns or goals. Um, that they're working on internally. Um, do they have maintenance issues? Um, does, does the company have project goals that are already budgeted for next year? Do they have uh, processes that use a lot of energy or create a lot of heat? Um, those kind of things. And then analyze the audit findings and incentive opportunities and create a plan to implement energy efficiency or renewable energy at your facility. And uh, it's about 12.30. That's all I got today. Um, you can find us on the web at eco Um And I appreciate everyone uh, tuning in today. Brian, thanks so much. We did have one question come in. Back to the power conditioning. Um, the question was, what actually is installed there um, to achieve uh, what you did in, in that case study? So, okay, there, it's a power conditioner box, and it's patented technology, but the the long and the short of it is we're adding capacitance to the line, which corrects power factor. Um, but it's, it's just not that simple. The boxes are adjustable, and they're sized specifically to a load, so you can actually overcorrect. So again, we need to um, get in there, see the, see the um, in, in the case of the power conditioning, we need to see the um, panel 
and then uh, copies of electrical bills so we know what the loads are by month. And then we're able to size the units um, to the specific load of the facility. But the, long, the quick answer is we're adding capacitance to the line. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Brian. Appreciate it. And um, if you have any other questions, uh, you can certainly give uh, uh, contact Brian. And uh, obviously, as you can see, very knowledgeable about lots of different options uh, for you. So again, Brian, thank you. Great information that you share. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, everybody. Uh, next month, our webinar will feature Scott Bushke of Cornerstone Business Services, who will present how to buy the right business. And in December, Bill Prusso of Pros for Technology will explain how to protect your business data. And then our January webinar, uh, just in time for those New Year's resolutions, is how to keep stress from eating you for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And looking way ahead in March, uh, we'll cover how to foster a culture of innovation and creativity. You can register for workshops and all upcoming webinars at uwgb.edu slash sbdc. We also have several past webinar recordings there on sales, marketing, business ownership, leadership, and professional development. In closing, I would very much like to thank Brian Schwaller of Ecomanity. Thank you again, Brian. Uh, Mickey and Tim at First Business Bank. And Michael Wentworth of TMR Associates. And thank you all for attending. Now, go offset those rising energy costs and increase your profitability. Have a great day. This concludes our webinar.